So it's down in the house. And I'm in my room. And I don't know what it was again, but I felt something creeping along the duvet. This was like a couple of years on from the first experience. And it was, it was like a cat walking along the, you know, the duvet. And I was going, that's nothing. So I'm you know, flipping the duvet, you know, whatever, you know, on my phone, what I'm doing, just trying to distract myself. And it kept happening. And it was like something was tugging at the, the duvet. Yeah, that freaked the life out of me. Hello and welcome to Your Ghost Stories. Today I'm joined by Joe Sweeney who emailed the show a few weeks back to tell me about the dark history of the estate he grew up on in London and also to talk about some of the experiences at a 500 year old haunted pub he previously worked at. So without further delay, welcome to the show Joe. Hey there mate, you alright? Yeah, very good man. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about the estate where you grew up? When did you first learn about its eerie past? So uh, it was something I had always known about um, growing up. Um, the estate uh, was built in the early 80s. It was built for the working families of the area. There had been uh, an estate there before, uh, which was demolished in the early 70s. And that had stood, I believe, for about 70 years. Um, whilst they were building the new estate in the early 80s, uh, they come aco- uh, across um several plague pits and these plague pits have been uh from the black death so where i grew up was just outside the city of london walls it was in uh which is now the start of the east end uh it's sort of around whopping between allgate between shadwell it's a it doesn't really have a name the area um it was originally in the early 1200s i believe uh, set up as an abbey by Matilda, the well, one of the queens anyway. And then after that time, uh, uh, the Black Death come around, 1347 or whatever it was. And yeah, there was up to, I believe, 700 bodies found there. Wow, that's that's crazy. I mean, a hell of a lot, like, yeah. You always hear about these kind of places growing up, you know. I remember as a kid, you always hear about you know, housing estates being built on top of ancient burial grounds, et cetera, et cetera. But you never believe it to be true. But yeah, it's crazy, crazy that, you know, you've actually, you can say it from experience that, you know, it's real. I mean, I was always probably one of the worst kids as well. I'm, you know, I'm six foot three, you know, big, bald, like, you know, scary looking guy. But I was always one of them sort of kids, you know, I'll, I'll fight any man, but, <laughs> you know, ghosts and things like that, I hated. It like always freaked me out, you know. And, um, yeah, it was like, my dad's got like records of it and stuff like that. I don't, I don't know how we got them, but he's got like, you know, he's got some form of records on them, like, you know, pictures and like when like the buildings were being put up and like, you know, when the you know the bodies were being exhumed and stuff like that. But he, um, yeah, it's, it's the whole, I mean, even like slightly down the road in Allgate, uh, so Again, on the boundaries of the city of London and the start of the East End, you've got like Allgate, and that's marked by the Allgate pump. And the Allgate pump was well known for, you know, great taste in water, you know? And they, like, you know, great taste, and it was something different tasting. It was, I don't know, I don't know who said it and where it was said, but it was found uh, during the time of the building of the railways, it was found to, uh, uh, the whole reason down to be, you know, this different taste of water was like the leak of calcium from bones and stuff like that, you know, in other graveyards along the, the water system. Some added minerals, therefore, everyone. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, lovely. Yeah, yeah. Nice, man. When you first started telling me that story, I was thinking about Peckham Springs, you know, water from Del Boy and Rodney. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm sure there's a few people trying to capitalise on it anyway. None of the people I grew up <laughs> around anyway. So, yeah. I always found it very strange. It was just a yeah it was it was a very bizarre thing you know 
it's obviously stuck with you, you know, all these years, you know, growing up in a place with such dark and interesting history. And it obviously clearly fascinates you as well. Um, so did you, you or your family experience anything unusual whilst living there? Uh, I did myself, yeah. Again, I never, I'm still a skeptic, believe it or not. Hmm. Uh, the, the experiences I've had, I'm still a skeptic. But, I'd, yeah, so my first one when I was, I can remember, when I was probably about 12, 13 years old, just finished school. I think I somehow didn't get detention for the day. <laughs> I mean, about four, half four, I can remember that sort of thing. Uh, my mother and father upstairs, it was like a little maze in it. So I'm sitting in the living room downstairs. And it was around December time, so it would have been pitch black. And I'm watching the telly. Then I see something in the corner of my eye. So I look up. And it wasn't as if it was there in front of me. It, was, it, it looked like it was behind a, a pane of glass, you know? You know, it looked like it was outside the window, but it wasn't outside the window. It was... Do you know what I mean? There was something covering it, you know? And it was a big, tall, big, tall man in sort of early, sort of, I'd say, sort of 20th century, late Victorian dress, you know? Like gaunt looking. It was, you know, sort of looked up, was there for a sec, looked back down, looked up again, and he was gone. And it was as if someone was looking from the outside in. And years later, now this could be me, you know, trying to find reason for it, I don't know. But I've seen pictures of my great grandfather, uh, my, my father's uh, grandfather, uh, and he like there's a picture of him, and he just looks a spitting image, like to my memory, what he looked like. But that could be because like the picture of that of that man then of like my grandfather, my great grandfather Tommy, was because he was an old man as well at the time. But I mean, the, you know, I've got saw a lot of sim similarities there, so that could have been a. You know, that could have been a connection there. I'm not too sure, you know. So as a self-proclaimed sceptic, how would you explain that? Do you think it was maybe, you know, something in your mind? Or do you think it was that was that encounter so real? Um, yeah, well, how, what, what would you ex how would you explain that off as a, as a sceptic? <laughs> well, you can't, can you? Uh, I think you've got to go, it's your age. You, you have to... I mean, I'm a skeptic because I want to be a skeptic. I'm a skeptic, you know, to make my, you know, to give myself a bit of peace, I suppose. But I'm 12, 13 years of age, starting to hit puberty. Hormones are flying around everywhere. Step, you know, starting to fly around everywhere, and you kind of, you don't know what, you know, your mind could be making up. You know, you really don't. But I, it could have been someone outside. It could have been a trick of the light. It could have been. It's just, I know everyone says a trick of the light, but it could have been someone outside. It could have generally been someone outside looking in, but it, it, it you yeah, know, it was yeah. from this side of the window. It was, it was very, very peculiar. You are, you are so right. I think sometimes there, there, most of the time there is a, a rational explanation. You know, maybe this person was off to a reenaction day <laughs> and just so happened to walk past your window and look in. <laughs> oh, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> but. Like you say, and it's something is th this kind of topic. Not everyone wants to dive into, and it is so much easier to just keep your head in the sand and just be like, "Yeah, no, whatever's going on there, I'm just gonna, you know, look the other way." Yeah, I mean, like I say, it was far easier for me to sort of poo poo it and go, oh, look, "I don't want anything to do with this." Like you know, it's it was, I remember jumping up straight, well, pretty much straight away, running upstairs. I think my mother had asked me to take the bin out. And, you know, I run around the back and took the bin out. I mean, just to, you know, distract myself, you know. Uh, I, went, I went into school the next day. And, you know, it's the kind of thing you don't want to talk about. And, you know, you don't really want to go, oh, Jesus, I'm seeing ghosts, you know. But there's people that I've been to, I've started talking to this kid and he said, well, yeah, apparently ghosts come out and visit you, you know. And there's, there's yeah, there's been a, there's been a couple of things at the, the flat there, you know. So... So how did this, how did this experience make you feel? What, did you feel just utter fear, like terrified, or was it more of a calming experience? It was definitely not a calming experience. Um, <laughs> there was just yeah, like I say, it was I, I was 
I just put it to the back of my mind. There was no aura around it. It wasn't like someone's come here to, you know, make me feel better about anything. It was just trying to explain it to myself. I had to try and go, well, what was the reason behind that? What was the reason behind this? What was the reason behind that? You know, I was trying to, I was trying to, you know, make sense of it, you know, in my head, but also at the same time, just trying to throw it to the back of my mind. And like I say, I was always one of them kids that was, you know, you know, I, I was always scared of like, you know, things that weren't real or like, I mean, say scared. I mean, I always had a like deep fear of death. You know, there was always that, you know, to a certain age, there was, that was playing in the back of my mind. Ghosts were always playing in the back of my mind. So I, I was probably putting it down to that as well. I was probably going, oh, it's just me worrying about things, even at such a young age, you know, 12, 13, you know, it was, you, and looking back on it, that, could have been what it was, but I mean, it seemed quite real at the time. And looking back, it seems quite real. So, yeah, I can can totally relate to what you're saying. You know, growing up as a as a young kid, I was the exact same. Um, you put on this like you know hard front, but inside, like things like you know ghosts and whatever. Yeah, you know, really, yeah exactly. It terrifies the life out of you. Um, but yeah, so what what other experience has happened in on that estate? In in the estate, so there's a pal of mine, Jack. He uh, he lives he lives about know, four doors down, let's say. And he he's, he said that his mother's had seen things like you know she was in her bed and there was like a woman in Victorian dress had come over and sat at the end of the bed, and that freaked you know freaked the life out of her, like you know. Uh, he had that as well. So I'm not the only one there to sort of experience it. But I mean, there are, there's probably, there's less people readily, you know, are, are going to admit it. You know, there's not too many people around there that are going to admit, you know, oh, you know, I've seen a ghost kind of thing. You know, the kind of people just, you know, you're working people, so you kind of put things like that to back your head. It's not the most pressing thing in your life, you know, you kind of, you know, it's that, you know, you're not going to go, I'll see a ghost yesterday and absolutely, you know, you know, get freaked out by it. You've got other things to worry about. You've got, you know, bills to pay. You've got, you know, I, th- I so I think that's why I always kept sort of slightly more quiet about it. Um, so like I said, but speaking to, like I say, my mate, uh, we, like, come up years later, and so I'm about, you know, 23, 24 at the time. He's a couple of years older. And he said, yeah, like my mother's seen the same thing. And he said, if I'm honest with you, mate, the same stuff freaks me, you know, freaks the life out of me. So I'm not the only one. And uh, for instance, there was another time when I was about to jump, jump into another story. When I was about 15. I was skipping school. Um, and... I used to go to school and I used to, you know, I'd skip school or I'd maybe go to school about half 12 because I knew the gates would be open kind of thing. You know, then I'd go in, mark myself off for the day and, you know, I got away with it a fair few times. And so I was, mum and, mother and father had gone out, uh, where my sister was living at the time, I don't know. But uh, there was no one in the house and I'm in my room and I don't know what it was again but I felt something creeping along the duvet so it was, it was as if like there was a cat this was like a couple of years on from the first experience and it was it was like a cat walking along the you know my duvet and I was going that's nothing so I'm you know, flipping the duvet you know whatever you know on my phone whatever I'm doing or telly or whatever just trying to distract myself and it kept happening and it was like something was tugging at the, the duvet as well now, that freaked the life out of me. So I ran into the, the bar room, brushed my teeth, and I darted across that road. And there was a there was an old couple that used to live there. They're a bit like you know, like sort of grandparents, you know, to me in the area. And I ran across that road, and I yeah, you know, I told them, and they were sort of church goers, you know, good Catholic people kind of thing. And they were like, no, nah, there's no such thing as ghosts and all the rest of it. You know, no such thing as that. And, they were like, you know, giving them all that sort of stuff. And if there was anyone there, they weren't, they weren't trying to hurt you, you know. But oh, that took me a good while to get that out of my head. And every now and again, that still pops in my head. That, that yeah, that really freaked me out. That did. 
it sounds like you've you've had some terrifying experiences for, throughout the you know throughout your childhood and it's not like you say it's not something that any any child's gonna want to encounter because it truly is terrifying you know the, it's it's completely unknown and and you, yeah he's you know especially like you say when you're alone in the house as well that's that's one thing that happens and it, and it completely changes your outlook for the rest of your life like you uh, it's either you know you think there's something going on in your mind or there's something going on that's literally completely unexplainable so how, how did your how did your family like react um like your mum and and whoever lived in the house with you at the time well so there was a couple other things where i was getting a bit worried as well there was so well, where the estate backs onto is where the old raw mint was and but there'd still be people in and out there uh at different times of night and whatever so it was no longer the mint but no, there was obviously there, and I remember one day I was I heard something going hello, hello, hello. Like you know, so I woke up in the middle of the night in a fright. Uh, I'd left the telly on overnight as well. I woke up at three, four o'clock in the morning, and uh, my room was right next door to me, mother and father's room. And I was, I remember waking up and like hearing hello, hello, like disembodied voices, you know. And I thought it could well have been something that was like the, this is my way of explaining it. The window wasn't open. But it was only, you know, single glazing. So it could have been an echo from the offices because it was like a deep cavern into like a small car park there they had, like, which was backing onto the, you know, uh, the mint. So that's how I explained that. Like, I remember waking up in a fright and I'd gone to my mother and like, you know, you know, you know just freaked out by it. And uh, it's like three o'clock in the morning. My dad's gone up, you know, got up, he's got to get ready for work. So I don't think he was best pleased. Uh, but I'd explained a few things to my mum and she, I think to sort of appease me, she was like, do you want me to, you know, get a priest around, you know, to bless the house? And I was like, no, not really. It's it's nothing that we, that we'd ever sort of, you know, grew up Catholic, but it was nothing we'd ever, you know, lapsed Catholics, you know. Uh, it was never anything I, that I ever thought would settle me. But uh, I remember that my mum wanted to, you know, get the house blessed and stuff like that, you know. Whereas I think my dad was uh, far more sceptical. Yeah, my dad was definitely far more sceptical. Sounds like your house, yeah, probably could have benefited from at least some kind of blessing. <laughs> yeah, and, they uh, weren't far too, sorry to interrupt, they were few and far, sorry, they were, they were quite sporadic, these experiences, you know. The, hmm. the, I mean, I still had the fear there, but there's people probably that are not like me, like at that age, the that probably would have found it calming and would have found it, you know, a completely different way. You know, they would have seen it as a relative coming back to, you know, guide them into this, that, the other, or, you know, you know, give them, you know, some form of peace kind of thing. But me personally, it, it just freaked the life out of me. Anyway, sorry, I do apologise. That's all good. Yeah, you, your parents, you know, they also have a role to protect you, right? So even if they did experience anything or see anything in that house you know of course they're probably they're going to try and hide that from you and and yep yeah, and make you feel safe right because that's their job um but yeah so it, did it did it kind of progress from there did did anything else happen or like you say was it just more sporadic and it's just just it's just one-off weird encounters every now and then say so one-off weird encounters every now and again mm. I'd, I'd say that's it yeah until yeah uh, working in that pub, I think. I, I think that was the next sort of, yeah, step on. I think so. Yeah, I, I can't really think of anything else that happened in in the house at the time, that particular time. Your ghost story. Your ghost story. Just want to take a moment to thank each and every one of you for your incredible support. Your Ghost Stories is just over a year old and we're currently getting around 10,000 organic listeners per month, which is mind-blowing. As most of you guys will know, Your Ghost Stories is a fully independent podcast and the running and upkeep of the show are entirely funded by myself. To help me continue bringing you these fascinating weekly interviews and stories, 
Your Ghost Stories is now accepting donations via PayPal. Each month, 50% of all donations will go to a different and selected charity, chosen by you through a poll on our Instagram page on the first of each month. The remaining 50% will be used directly to help keep the podcast up and running and expand our reach through marketing. Your contributions not only help us to grow and continue to thrive, but more importantly, will make a difference in the world. You'll find a link to donate any amount of your choice in the description of this episode or via the website yourghoststoriespodcast.com. If you're not in a position to donate, I totally understand. Times are difficult for a lot of people right now, but if you still want to help support the show for free, you can do this by following the podcast on Spotify or Apple or wherever you listen to this podcast, or even better, by leaving us a kind review to help others just like you find the show. Thank you so much for your generosity and support. So the 500-year-old pub that you worked in, was that also in London? Yeah, it was only down the road, so uh, it was in Wapping. So the oldest pub on the River Thames. Uh, Now, this act's 500 years old. It was partially burnt down uh, in the late 18th century and uh, rebuilt using materials that come down from a colliery ship. It's called the Prospect of Whitby, and this colliery ship come from Whitby, and then that's how it got its name. But it used to be colloquially known as the uh, the Devil's Tavern. Uh, the whole area, like Wapping itself. So where I live, there's not got a name. I'd grown up there. I've never known it to be a name. It's in the old borough of Stepney. It's next to Cable Street, heading down towards Shadwell. There, it's got all day there. I know you don't know the area, but it's just it's in a whole it's like a whole amalgamation of you know different areas. But Wapping itself is quite proud of. Uh, what they are and who they are. I mean, there was people. So my father first moved down towards the area in the uh, late seventies, while it was still high dock walls and stuff like that. And he he just remembers people. You know, he was drinking in a pub in one side of Wapping. There was a barmaid there was from the other side of Wapping. And the only time she'd ever been outside of Wapping was to go hopping as a kid. You know, to pick hops. And this woman was probably about my age now, so she was probably only about you know, 26, 27, but she still would never been over the four bridges or, you know, how many bridges there are in Wapping. You know, you're not a true Wappingite unless you're from over the four bridges. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of, there's a lot of history in that area, you know? Mm. So yeah, sorry. Was there a specific spirit or ghost that was particularly meant to be active or well known amongst the staff or patrons in this pub? Yeah, the famous hanging judge. So, Judge Jeffries, uh, he was known to frequent sort of a few pubs in Wapping. He was, yeah, he was, the, he was, he was, he was not a very nice man by all accounts. Uh, he wanted to, um, I think I think he was a royalist or whatever. And during the time of the Monmouth Rebellion, uh, rebellion, I think it was James II. I think it was. Anyway, whatever the case, he wanted to. Uh, he was yeah, he was a royalist, and then the, all these. Uh, I think he put a lot of people to death. I think he went out to the West Country, like around Monmouth waves, you know, towards Wales, and acting on the king's behalf, had uh, executed a lot of people. And he was just known not to be a very nice man. I think he suffered quite suffered quite badly with uh, something like gallstones. He was a heavy drinker as well. Uh, he ended up being uh, caught up to, and uh, I believe hung in Wapping. Yeah, he was hung in Wapping uh, on uh, um, execution dock. Uh, for the, I think he stepped on too many people's toes at one stage, and that's how he ended up. Uh, yeah, finding his own demise and. Yeah, he used to, uh, yeah, reputedly uh, hold the pub like. Sounds like that place has got some fascinating history. I'm sure the walls have seen some stuff over the countless years. Uh, can you describe the atmosphere in the pub during like the quieter times? Did it feel different when there were fewer people around? Well, 
the pub itself, I don't know if you know anything about the pub, but it, uh, it does come up a lot in haunted sort of, you know, pub crawls and haunted London and things like that. Uh, yeah, there'd be times when, like me and a pal would be sitting outside. There'd be there's a small veranda on the uh, on the on the, the like, you know downstairs, and we'd sit out there after doing a shift. And it was very busy, you know, like it could be a very busy pub with, you know, you know, especially with tight labour and stuff like that. You'd only be a couple of you on a shift, and you'd be like you're running your thing off. So well deserved drink at the end of the night, and you're sitting outside, and there was a hanging loose out there. So you'd sit there having a drink and you're sitting there watching, like looking at a scaffold with a noose hanging off there, which was, it, it was a gimmick. Yeah, I think it was a gimmick that was put up about 50 or 60 years ago. But, you know, it might attract the ghost, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, it's not too, the pub itself is not too far from where they actually used to hang pirates and things like that. And it was quite freaky, you know, it was a flagstone floor, pewter bar. Uh, I'd have to go upstairs to if I was cashing up at the end of the night, I'd have to go upstairs. Uh, if it's pitch black, there's different rooms, old rickety, woody rooms, you know, and, you know, the smells are different. It's very, yeah, it's, it could be very freaky. And there's times where, especially when you're on your own, you know, I, I remember having a drink just to try to get myself through the night, you know, sometimes, you know, which is quite a common thing for pubs, but not when you're on your own, just because you're you know, scared of the environment kind of thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. How did your colleagues react to these spooky tales? Like, did it change the way you guys worked or interacted with each other? So I imagine, you know, nobody that worked there wanted to, you know, be alone and go in the cellar or the or the attic or whatever. Yeah, so uh, I remember one night, and it was probably down towards the end of our tenure, and we We'd all seen a few things, whatever else, and there was a pal of mine, Dan. There is a pal of mine, Dan. And uh, we hadn't locked one of the rooms. And it was the, 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 I don't know, you've got the different names from, I think the, the Peeps room, they call it, right? After Samuel Peeps. And he went, okay. Right. I said, all right, I'm going to go up, shut the door, lock it, whatever else, you know. And uh, as I'm going up there, he goes, don't go out there on your own. I'm not, I've been doing this for two years. <laughs> I've been doing this on my own. Like, you know, what's up with you? He said, no, don't go out there on your own. He says, there was a time I was up there on my own. And he's a bit sceptic as well. But he was, he, he had something thrown at him. And he thought it was someone else. But the other person was downstairs. He had a bottle of Tabasco thrown at him, like flew at him across, <laughs> like from across the room. So I've, but as he said this, I'm going upstairs and he's coming up behind me. And I'm like, I said, Dan, would you leave me alone? I'm only going to shut the door. What's up with yeah. So he stops dead in his tracks. And he's like, Joe, did you see that? And I'm like, no. Because I'm just out of shot of the room. Like, you know, I'm on the corner of the bend and he can just start, the, you know, he can see the room, you know. And he's like, Joe, did you not see that? Joe, come back here. And we're looking in this room. I couldn't see anything. But he was adamant that he saw something. He said, that's why you don't go upstairs on your own and this, that, and the other. I mean, I'd I'd slept in the room upstairs with like you know, with a drink on me, you know, like you know, two, three, like four o'clock in the morning, going off, oh, can't be bothered going home, you know, well, you know, slept there overnight. Uh, nothing had happened then, but there were definitely other spooky things, and like we had a seance down there once, and like you know, a paranormal team had come in. And the, I mean, I think everyone there that that worked there had definitely. You know, had some form of, you know, there was some experience. You know, someone had something happen to them at some stage. You know, or had worked with someone on shift while something happened to someone else. You know, I think everyone there had the same thing. That's quite terrifying with all the seances and investigations and Ouija boards like going on there. Because if things are, yeah, I'm sure if things weren't done properly, that's just like an invite for these, you know, spirits or evil spirits, whatever, to just, you know. Come, come in, guys. Come for a pint. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they were telling us about it. So they done, uh, and then it, so just tell me if I'm going on a little bit too much. Uh, no, go for it. I, I know, I know, I can waffle on a little bit. Um, so we, I was, there was a, a woman coming. Uh, she, she actually done a paranormal investigation. She's on Amazon Prime at the minute, and she's. You know, she's done all right for herself and she's a very nice woman. 
and she, I mean, for a, a ghost hunt, just to see the area, suspect, like, you know, sort of, you know, just sort of sus, sus it. She'd been there the year before, not a lot had happened. And she got chatting away to me. I'd finished my shift a little bit early. A couple of pals were there and they were closing up and it was on a Sunday. So I shut the pub for about 11. I might finish about nine. I've had a couple of pints, whatever else, just talking to a couple of regulars with, and I got chatting to them and I wasn't necessarily poo-pooing uh, the, you know, like the paranormal or anything like that. But she was like, you don't believe, do you? And I was like, no, not particularly, no. But, you know, I, I think I sort of got to that age where I was going, whatever that happened to me teens, you know, that was, that was, you know, because I was hormones and stuff like that, you know, I'd sort of put it all behind me. And she's going, you don't believe it. I said, no, not particularly. But I said, but you do you, you know, it's, it's your thing. You know, I wasn't, you know, I was having a go at her about it. She was just, it was more, you know, I just, it wasn't my kind of thing. And she went, all right then, uh, I'm going to make you believe. But it's then to me, kind of you're going, that's a bit, you're going to make me believe. So what are you going to come out with? So we sat around and done a seance. After shut the pub, went up to that one particular room where the Tabasco bottle was from. All sort of holding hands. I've got a pint in front of me. It's all on Facebook Live. We're all, you know, it's all it's all pretty, you know, it's all seriously done. And uh, me and me two pals there, and I'm I'm at the point where I'm going, well, this, right, this is silly. Like it's the first thing I've ever done. You know, I've never done this kind of thing before. And I'm going, this is a bit silly. Do you know what I mean? It's a bit, you know, stupid. Do you know what I mean? Can you, you know, I judge Jeffries. I don't believe you're here. Oh. Uh, Irish Anne that sits on the stairs. I don't believe you're here. You know, show me you're here. I hear you want to hurt people and all this sort of thing. All of a sudden, she's become possessed by Judge Jeffries, and the table was sitting on. She's foaming at her mouth. The table's rocking back and forth, and I'm sitting there with half a smile on me, and she's looking at me. So it starts going, oh, "I'm going to kill you. It's your one. I'm going to kill," and all the rest of it. So apparently, Judge Jeffries. She was Judge Jeffries at the time. And he took a dislike into me, which I thought, oh, good. Like, you know, <laughs> which was, she goes, yeah, I'll see you on the stairs. I don't know. She went off on that. You don't believe in me. Yeah, 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 100%. I yeah, bet it was a lot more violent than, you know, it was sort of like, say violent, but I mean. Do you think she was putting it on at all, like, especially as a skeptic? That, when she was said, when she said that, you know, I'm going to make you believe kind of thing. But she was adamant that something has, you know, happened. And, but, so I come away from that going, yeah, Jesus, all right, like, you know, give it up, you know, mm. that kind of thing. But the two lads that were with her, they'd, you know, she was getting something out. I mean, she wasn't being paid for doing this, but she was, she was like, you know, like, I, I don't know where, but, like, you know, whether it's like built with a reputation, whether it's just a really nice woman, like, you know. Mm. And uh, it was arranged for her to come back. Uh, a week later and she wanted me and my two pals to be there uh, one of my pals didn't want to do it he uh, he sort of uh, sculpted off he uh, he didn't fancy it so this Monday night about a week later we're, uh, we're in there it was her about five other paranormal investigators that we'd like to do with her. One of the sugar babes that she's related to. I don't know, that was a bit, that was a bit weird. Yeah, it's a random one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was me and me, mate. And same thing. I probably, like I say, not poo-pooed it, but I just, I, I, you know, I was playing sceptic. And I put it to the back of my mind and I went, Okay, I just, you know, I've just finished work. I'm going to cut beers. It was all very chilled out. It was all very, like, you know. Uh, they start going around the room, Facebook Live. And I remember, like, everyone was talking. They were going, oh, this, is, this is Joe. This is Dan. They work at the, at the pub. And we're going, hello, how's everyone? Kind of thing. And uh, she started getting on the radio, like, the, like t- tuning into sort of frequencies and like getting voices coming through and like, you know, you're not powerful and that. And she was, you know, she was shouting and roaring. And I was, I, again, I was playing a skeptic. I remember at one stage, I'd, I'd, I think I'd accidentally, um, I don't know, the heathen that I am, I think I'd uh, accidentally burped, you know, out loud. 
as everyone's concentrating on this. And everyone turned around and went, did you hear that? Did you hear that? And I took, like, <laughs> my, mate, my, my mate was hitting me going, Joe, shut up here. Like, you know, <laughs> I didn't mean it. It was just, just come out. But as the night progressed, uh, my other mate that sculpted off, he just sculpted off to do a bit of office work. It was still only about 12 o'clock, you know, like there's no patrons in the pub or whatever. But uh, he, he'd come back and after the initial sort of assessment and we all went downstairs, the woman had started speaking to him. And she said, and got into some personal stuff and, you know, sort of went, you used to suffer with asthma as a child, didn't you? And he goes, yeah, yeah. And she says, well, you had it quite bad, didn't you? Like, you know, he said, you nearly, uh, you nearly, you know, you had to go to hospital and you nearly died or something. And he went, yeah, that actually happened. And I've gone, okay, this is a bit weird. Like, you know, they've never met each other before and it's not one of us that would have known that. Then he started speaking about the other personal family stuff with him. And he was like, yeah, spot on. And I was like, right, I don't like this anymore. I'm a bit freaked out now. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, holding on to me mate's hand, going, I'm not too sure about this. Hmm. And the night progressed again, and we all got split up into different rooms. And I went into, my mate got put into a room in, in, the, in the pub's kitchen. And it was all pitch black, and lights started going off. And But just before he went in there, he went to me, I said, Blood. she goes, oh, she wants me to go in there. I said, why she want you to go in there? She goes, oh, she can feel on it. What he wasn't telling me that that you know that unfortunately there had been an incident in there like you know like years and years prior and it wasn't very nice and um yeah uh i let them when he sort of told me about it, it afterwards it honestly it freaked me out to you know to no end but, you know like i was, I was any time we were going to any other room I was you know sitting right beside him I was pretty much sitting on his lap you know it was <laughs> it was really freaky so yeah that was pretty much the seance and you know what happened with the paranormal investigators did you ever feel truly like threatened or scared by these paranormal activities or was it more just like curiosity for you uh yeah there would be some uh I think it's the word would be like trepidation, you know, when you're going around the rooms and stuff like that. There'd be, yeah, there'd be, a, there'd be some minute amount of fear there, yeah. And like I say, you'd have to have a drink just to settle your nerves, you know. That'd be the thing. I, I bet you were kind of glad the day you quit. Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I do. Don't get me wrong, I do miss it to that point because I do quite like my history, you know. So there are. Yeah, you know, working in a pub like that with all the history and it's it's quite interesting. But uh, yeah, the, I don't miss the uh, yeah, like you say, catching up at the end of the night and having to go upstairs and creeping up there and freaking yourself out in the office at one stage and you know the only one left in the building if the the manager ain't in a flat, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You see, you come across very knowledgeable about you know the history of these places. It's really really fascinating D- during your research what what else have you uncovered about the pub so you mentioned about the the judge is there anyone else that resided there or used to visit the pub uh just a lot of famous actors and things like that but cannot uh in terms of like villains and stuff like that uh no i can't i, I can't really think of anyone off the top of my head if i'm totally honest with you <laughs> no that's um, fair enough, mate. there's i can't remember who they like i say it wasn't a very it was a very like sort of like I say it used to be called the Devil's Heaven mm. and it was like locally known as and it was like I say the whopping was you know if you're not from over four bridges and that kind of thing so it was very sort of secular you know so I'm sure yeah. a lot of bad things did go down there you know like it was just an island unto itself do you know where the name came from the Devil's Tavern yeah it's just pretty sinister in itself isn't it so it was called the I think the original, I don't think it was the original name for it. it was a, I, I don't know. I know it was called the Pelican at one stage. And then the time was, you know, your pirates, your smugglers, and your, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, that's when it's become known as a Devil's Tavern, you know. It was, it was just because of punch ups and, you know, you know, the, you know, sort of the fairest characters that would frequent the pub, you know. Mm. 
All right, well, Joe, thanks so much for taking your time on a Sunday to come and chat about this. It's been, yeah, really, really interesting, and I really appreciate your time. I've just got one question to finish up on, a bit of a random one, but if you were to become a ghost, what would be the first thing that you did? You have freedom to do kind of whatever. What would it be? Freedom to do? Ah, uh, that's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know what I'd say for that, man. I think I'll probably go back to that pub and uh, give Judge Jeffries a good kicking, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what I'd do for all that's the uh, all that he brought me through, yeah. <laughs> all right, mate. Yeah, well, all right, then. Lovely to speak to you. Yeah, you too, yeah, buddy. Thanks for having me on, mate. Yeah, no worries. Stay in touch. Nice one, mate. Thank you, man. Cheers. Bye, mate.